You're about to meet the woman who is at the helm of the Dimmick Center. It's located in Roxbury, and it is the second largest health center in Boston, providing care to more, to more than 17,000 people annually through comprehensive health and human services. And you know what? The Dimmick Center is also the largest employer in Roxbury. So what does it take to do this job? Beyond her experience as a physician with a medical degree from Brown University and an MBA from Johns Hopkins, the president and CEO of the Dimmick Center is a dedicated wife and mother who is also a charismatic leader. In fact, she was recently recognized as one of the top 100 most influential people in Boston by Boston Magazine. And for women of color, she's living proof that obstacles can be leaped over, dreams can come true if you breathe life into them and you don't accept no for an answer and you show passion and purpose. Please join me in welcoming my very good friend, Dr. Maisha Minter Jordan. Hi, how are you? Good. Whoops, we got our cords all tangled up for just one second. Okay. Welcome to the Massachusetts Hospital Association's Leadership Conference. Pretty cool, huh? Yes, thank you for having me. I was awesome. so excited that you could come because you're so busy, I can never get in touch with you. <laughs> I have to go through like th three layers of people oh, to talk Team Maisha. I have to talk to Team Maisha. <laughs> You know, when we first spoke to one another, you had just taken on the job yes. as CEO of the Demic. You'd been the chief medical officer. Mm -hmm. As you look back on these last five years, what has been the biggest hurdle for you to overcome? I think one of the biggest hurdles was making the transition from really being a physician and being in the one-on-one -on -one interactions with patients to thinking more about a very broad system. And I think additionally is really amassing the right team that would support all of the work of the organization and, and leveraging that team to move the organization forward. Demick has an incredible history that I'm sure we'll be able to get to. Sure. So there were some big shoes to fill, and so those were the things that I think worried me the most in those first five years. I'm gonna guess that there was probably a moment where you know you moved into that, that corner office and the, then they shut the door and you sat there and said, oh my God. <laughs> Really? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like medical school, business school, they don't prepare you for, oh, now you have to raise $16 million for this building. <laughs> so um, really trying to understand and being able to um, give voice to and represent yeah. all that DEMIC is and stands for to very different groups of stakeholders was, was something that I really had to wrap my mind around. Well, you know, when, when I introduced Maisha, I said that it is a national model for comprehensive health and human services. Tell me what sets you apart and why people want to copy what you do sure. at the DEMIC Center. So I think what sets us apart is an incredible history of female leadership uh, beginning in 1862 is the uh, New England Hospital for Women and Children, which was started by female physicians at a time where they were not able to learn at other medical schools. First nurse in the country practiced there, Linda Richards, trained the first African-American nurse. So you have all of these important aspects of female leadership. Then moving into a community health center in 1969 and really thinking about what does the community need in developing behavioral health programs, early education programs for children and their families, and then the health center. So there's this nine acre, nine building beautiful campus in the heart of Roxbury that represents all of these comprehensive social services that really distinguishes us from other community health centers and quite frankly from what I thought a community health center was before I got there. You know, I remember the first time I, I came to, to visit Maisha and you, you, you go through Roxbury and then you kind of go, there's these like pillars and mm -hmm. then you go up this hill mm -hmm. and you're in a whole different place. You even got a daycare center there. How many we children? Do are on campus. So we have about 500 children on our campus every day from zero to five, which you would never Isn't expect. That crazy? And when you think about a community health center and yes. coming from academia, I had this idea of a community health center being this one building where everything looked kind of poor and the physicians weren't that well trained and had all of these notions that completely were blown out of the water the moment I stepped onto our campus. 
one of the parts of this campus has to do with substance abuse. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about the opioid crisis from your perspective, because mm -hmm. I know that you've been uh, part of some of uh, the governor's and the mayor's boards mm -hmm. on this crisis. Yes. As a doctor, as an administrator, where are we with this epidemic? We're in a tough place. And I think part of what I always I wrestle <clears throat> with, but not as much anymore, is you know it's an epidemic now. And it's an epidemic that impacts every area that we can think of, every gender, every ethnicity, um, but it has been an issue in the Roxbury community for so many years. And it was really demonized, criminalized in many ways for people of color. And now we're in a place where there's greater recognition of it as a disease. We're now using disease. We're now saying substance use disorder, which for me is important for our community as well as all other communities. And the ability to participate at the state level, at the city level, and bring more resources to our community is what really drives me. But we are, I mean, people are dying every day. And the face of this epidemic is a diverse face. And I think the more we can talk about it, the more we can work on stigma, work on you know, opening up the conversation so families don't feel ashamed to talk about someone within their family with this disease, um, the better we can do at really trying to turn the tide on the number of deaths that happen. You know, we, we heard Dr. Silver talking about hashtag be ethical. Mm -hmm. What's on your health care wish list? Oh, gosh, it's a long list. It's a long one. Uh, well, the first, I think, um, and what really I, I take my experience at Demick is really thinking about being more comprehensive and holistic. You know, just hearing Dr. Silver speak about the fact that everything is disjointed. We don't think about rehab and, and when we think about cancer. We don't think about education when we think about health care. If you're not educated, it's very difficult to be healthy and to make good choices. And so what Demick represents for me is this comprehensive approach to thinking about health care. We have to be educated. We have to think about behavioral health and the integration with primary care. These are not two distinct things. We are one body, right? And so we need to think of our system as addressing that one body. So my, my list of priorities really focuses on being integrated and holistic in our approach to care. You know, I, I feel like our upbringings are a huge part of mm. what makes us who we are. So one of my favorite questions that I like to ask when I sit one-on-one -on -one with a woman like you is, can you walk us through a little bit about what your upbringing was like? Where are you from? Mm -hmm. And what was the message in your home growing up? So um, I'm from Long Island, New York. And Long Island. Long Island. I won't say Long Island. I say Long Island. Um, and I grew up with m my mom was a nurse for 35 years. Are there nurses here? All so right. my mom was an orthopedic nurse. And so if you are familiar with orthopedic nurses, they do not play. <laughs> and so uh, she was very much like, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're, you're going to do you know, your studies. And I had to do, I did research every year in high school. My father worked for the Department of Sanitation in New York, and they both left New York with amazing pensions and retired at age, the age of 55. So great. I had a great upbringing um, with a, a family Brothers, that was- Brothers, sisters? I have an older sister. And my, she's seven years my senior, and uh, my family was focused on education and, and also focused on realizing that we, give, we, we were respectful to everyone. And I, that's something that I've carried with me, particularly with my mom as a nurse. One of the first things I did when I hit the floor in, the me in medical school was tell every nurse, my mom was a nurse, so that they would be <laughs> nice to me. And, 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 it, and, and I was so respectful of the role of nurses in healthcare. And I watched my colleagues who didn't have that in their brains and how, how, how they were treated. Um, because it's, medicine is a field can, that can be very hierarchical, but yes. when you're grounded in respecting everyone and understanding that it's a team approach, you fare much better when you're in training for sure, but it makes you a better physician. I hope you'll share with us a story that you told me in a recent interview about um, your graduation from medical school was a pretty big deal. Yes. In fact, the whole family showed up. Everyone. <laughs> Tell us about that day. I think we took up the entire um, <laughs> venue at, at No Brown. one had gone to medical school, obviously. No, you're, no, you're, no you're, one at you're, that time had mom's gone to a nurse, medical school. My mom's a nurse. So it was a big deal. And what, what it was was, and beyond my family, um, the, the staff in the hospitals, the people that looked like me were so supportive. And yes. so it was this day of just jubilation and yeah. pride. And uh, I just remember that um, I had made it. I had made it and, it and it represented so much to so many that was well beyond me. And I, and I felt that and I carry that with me to this day, but it was a, it was a beautiful day. When you raise your hand and you take the Hippocratic Oath mm -hmm. to do no further harm, yes. right? Yes. How does that feel? 
it's a responsibility that you have to take with you in, in, in everything that you do and every way that you have interactions with patients, thinking about not what's best, not what you think is best, but what is really best for the patient and really understanding how do you come to that within a conversation, in a discussion with the patient. It's, for me, it's around patient empowerment. And that's, a, that's also, we sometimes come to these interactions with preconceived notions. You need to eat better, you need to exercise. What if you can't access food? What if you're too afraid to go outside because there vi there's violence in the streets? And so it's around thinking through what is, not only what is best for the patient, but understanding their lives in the context of their lives to come up with a plan with them around their care and around their well-being. So it's an immense responsibility. You know, you mentioned that when you hit the floor, you'd say, my mom's a nurse, <laughs> I, I, you know. But did you ever feel like you weren't given the respect that you needed okay. uh, as, as an African-American woman, yeah. as a nurse? I it, mean, as a yeah. doctor, tell me about that. It would, it would be amazing. I'm in a white coat with a, with a stethoscope around my neck and being handed a lunch tray uh, or being told that the TV doesn't work. And, uh, and what was really funny, there was the look of, once you explain who you are, the shock on the face, and the realization that I'm putting my life in this person's hands who I've just insulted. Um, uh, <laughs> I just handed them my lunch tray. <laughs> this is so not going well. That kind of course correction is like, okay, <laughs> now let's start over. Um, but it, there definitely have been and continue to be those instances where people underestimate you and, and don't, um, don't respect you. And uh, I think what I've come to learn is, particularly if you're the only person of color or the only woman in a room, is not feeling like I'm the only woman in the room or the only person of color. It's I am that one person, therefore everyone will remember me. That's right. And, there, and I'm meant to be in that room. Yes. And I'm meant to be yes. at that table. And really turning, the, turning my own thinking around that um, is such that it becomes I'm empowered in that way. And you know, when you're in a situation like that, you can't stamp your feet, because that's no. not gonna solve anything. No, But no. like you said, you have to then be the role model. That's right, that's right. Do you miss the patient doctor contact, oh, yeah. the one, because you're a pediatrician by... Internal medicine, oh, I'm an okay, internist. Okay. Um, I do, um, and I did not Because I really kids. want I you to be kids. my doctor all the time. <laughs> I love kids, but uh, the parents are tough. <laughs> but no, I, I do miss those one-on-one -on -one yeah. interactions with patients, but I think about the fact that I have the opportunity to impact a larger system. And I often, having practiced medicine and now being in the role that I am at DEMIC, I often see my old patients and they say, Dr. Jordan, when are you coming back? <laughs> but for me, it's, I, but I made the system better. I've, got, I've brought new programs and services for the community. So I balance it with that, but I often do really miss that. What is your leadership philosophy? My leadership philosophy, so I, I really try to govern myself by four values, transparency, respect, accountability, and communication. And uh, it took me a while to come to those values and to understand what they mean in practice. Um, but when I communicate them, it's, it's made me a much more effective leader because people know what to expect. If I feel like I'm not getting the information, they understand, well, we've got to get Maisha the information she needs. Or if I feel like there isn't a, an, an environment of respect where I'm trying to work towards that. So I really try to govern my leadership in that way and try to model that as best I can, um, both at work and at home. When we first saw each other this morning, we were sitting with Dr. Silver and she was giving us a little update on her kids and mm -hmm. we all know about that. Uh, and you were mentioning your girls. Yes. Sixth grade and eighth grade. Yes, that's right. That's a challenge. It is a challenge. Talk Every to us a little bit about your daughters. And, and also, you know, yeah. I, I think it's BS. It's very difficult to balance being a doctor and running a, a, a health center and being a fantastic parent. But we're yeah. pulled in a million different directions. Give us yep. a snapshot of, of your home life. You do the best you can every day. So uh, as an example, this morning, my 11-year-old is meandering around, doesn't know where her glasses are. <laughs> I don't, I don't, doesn't have a jacket. My 13 year old is looking at herself in the mirror for, for God knows how long. Um, so it's, you, you sort of, you wake up every day just trying to balance schedules. My husband right. is fantastic, um, but trying to think about all the things that need to be done, trying to check in with your kids, getting them off, and I do drop off, so getting them off on time, and then working throughout the day and getting home and then checking in again. Yeah. And if I can do that, I feel like it's been a pretty good day, even yeah. no matter what time I get home. Um, and I you know, talk about my day, I talk about the struggles and try to keep it very real with my children. And I think because my husband is a special education teacher and I'm in the field, I'm in, they understand the importance of giving back. 
and I, and I try to bring them into the things that I do so that I'm developing that culture within them. They're very privileged. They didn't grow up. Even as I grew up middle class, I think they're, you know, they're privileged in other ways. And so trying to keep them humble is important and trying to make sure they understand the importance of the work that we do and the work that I hope they will do. Whatever they do, I want it to resonate with them and have value. You know, I remember I, I, I was a, a single mom for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I remember a very wise woman talking to me one day and saying, you know what, Candy? You just do the best that you can. Mm -hmm. Because I was always trying to compare myself yeah. to you know, moms who were able to be blessed to be home all day. And, mm -hmm. and that's hard. Oh, yeah. I don't do that. <laughs> but, but that's a very powerful message for our daughters, isn't it? It is. You, and, I, and I admit when I make mistakes. Yes. You know, and I, we had yes. to develop some rules. You're on the phone when you get home, Mommy. OK, we're going to make this rule. When I walk in the door, I'm not on the phone until you go to bed and being present yes. so, and they you know looking them in the eye yes. those are things that I work on and they hold me accountable for what is the best piece of advice you have ever received go with your gut go with your instinct I think sometimes we know it and we're afraid and the more that I've done that I've been more right than I've been wrong and so I think just leading with that and and really believing in yourself so that you feel okay with making decisions in that way you know, I'm so grateful to you and Dr. Silver for sitting here, taking time this morning to share your stories. And overcoming obstacles mm -hmm. is a big part of some of the questions we always ask mm -hmm. on this program. Mm -hmm. How do you get around an obstacle in your path? I try to see past it. I try to think about once we get through this period or once we get through this issue, then what? And, I've, and I feel like I've, someone said that to me, some leaders see the way out. So I'm always figuring out a way out, um, and, and I, that has worked for me. I mean, sometimes you're just like, this is really gonna be hard for X amount of time, but on the other side, it's gonna be okay, and it's, gonna, it's just a phase, it's a, it's a period of time, and so I really think of things in that way, um, and it served me well. Success means different things to different people at different times in their lives. Mm -hmm. Where you are right now, mm -hmm. How does success feel? What is it mm. like for you? Are you there? Are you still striving? We're, let's take your pulse. Yeah. I think we should always strive for more, um, but I feel like I'm balanced. My kids are doing well. I, I love what I do every day. Even on the worst days, I go home and feel like I did something that helped somebody today. And so I think as long as I feel that way, I, I feel successful. Um, and I've achieved a lot, but I think there's a lot more that I could achieve um, with, with the right, always having the right intentions and the right moral compass. And so I, um, I think that's a good place to be. Let's hear it for Dr. Minter Jordan. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're doing really well for time. Uh, can, can we uh, field a couple of questions, please, from the audience? Anybody? Right up here. Thank you. And over there, too. Yay. Please tell us your name. Uh, Maggie Carey. Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm with UMass Medical School, and we work. I work closely with Mass Health. Mm -hmm. Do you have the bandwidth, and is there space with the population you serve to help with the integration of mind and body? And how does that happen? And mm -hmm. when it doesn't work, what do you do? So um, we're fully integrated in terms of our behavioral health and primary care practices. So any patient that walks into the health center, whether or not they're walking into pediatrics or OB or adult, is fully assessed for any behavioral health needs they have. Our teams are fully integrated and co-located on the same medical record. So we're, we're doing that. We've also, in the last two years, integrated substance use disorder services. So that's the way that we now practice. And we're also screening for all of the um, socioeconomic impacts, whether or not it's food and housing, we're screening for that as well and have resource, resource coordinators integrated with the teams. Part of what we're doing now, particularly in our residential programs, is bringing in more mindfulness work. Um, we do uh, with our women's, we have four residential programs on our campus, um, housing 22 men or women in each. And we have mindfulness practice within each of those programs. We have yoga classes for our, for our residents as well. So in yoga is a big piece of my life. It's the way that I stay sane. Um, so I'm, I'm very, and we have boot camp for our men in the men's program. So I, I really do um, try to practice what I preach. So we, we do a lot of that work. And I think that's one of the distinguishing factors about our model. Thank you for that question. 
Good morning. This is Good terrific. Morning. Um, my name is Maureen Johnson. I'm from Beth Israel Deaconess Milton Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about health disparities and how you see us addressing those and changing those and being com good community partners and sure. the work that you're doing in this space. Thank you for that question as well. Um, I think the first step regarding health disparities is, is the data, right? So there are different entities. I'm on the board of the Boston Public Health Commission. We have a lot of data around disparities, but what I found is insurers don't always collect that data. Um, hospitals don't always, don't always collect the data, although it's out there from the city and state level. So I think in small ways, at least to start, is understanding, as an example, when we look at our, our um, cardiology clinic, what are the disparities in terms of control of hypertension of whites versus blacks versus Latinos and Asians and others? And making that part of the fabric of the data sets. We often look at healthcare outcomes as distinct from disparity data, and I think we really need to merge those. And as we think about approaches to um, really reducing disparities, it happens with first understanding what the issues are. So I think that that's something that's really important and we try to do that in our work. What I try not to fall back on is the fact that we are an organization that serves primarily underserved individuals doesn't mean that we're addressing disparities. There are differences within subsets of groups with that we serve. Our Latino patients versus our black patients and getting our providers to wrap their mind around that is, has been somewhat of a cultural shift. But it's something that we continue to talk about, particularly within the behavioral health space and the opioid epidemic, we are creating really good models of care that are one size fits all. And now that we are beginning to develop those models, we really need to layer in disparities to understand what are the approaches that we need for different um, subsets um, within that group. We have time for another question, right over here. Hi, um, Maria Hood, Partners Healthcare, and I'm really glad that I'm here today. I was wondering in terms of, um, you had a great role model, your mother was in healthcare, and um, what can we do in terms of the whole STEM um, education, and but bringing that to some of our underprivileged minority youth mm -hmm. girls that don't have um, some of those role models or access to some of the, the different opportunities? So I've, I'm really blessed to have opportunities to speak at different schools and middle schools, and I think it's bringing those role models mm -hmm. in. Um, and there are so many physicians that if you, or providers at every level, and I also think that's very important, not everyone has to be a doctor. So thinking about you know, medical assistants, nurses, giving them the opportunity to go to a middle school or to a high school and speak works wonders. It's amazing the questions that the kids come up with, they're so excited to have you there and to see you there. And, and I don't remember, that didn't happen for me. Um, so I think um, trying to work within the hospital system and putting that question out there to the various um, groups within to say, would you like to speak at a school and creating a partnership with the schools in the area is a really great way of introducing STEM at an early age and the possibility of careers in STEM to young girls. Let's hear it for Dr. Minter Jordan. Thank you. 